So we today are on Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 5, Text 27. Tato Bhavan Mahatatvam Tato Bhavan Mahatatvam Avyaktat Kala Choditat Avyaktat Kala Choditat Vigyan at Matma Dehas Tang Vigyan at Matma Dehas Tang Vishwam Vian Jamstamo Nudaha Vishwam Vigyan Jams Vishwam Vian Jamstamo Nuda Tato Bhavan Mahatatvam Avyuktat Kala Choditat Vigyanat Matma Dehas Tang Vishwam Vim Jamstamo Nuda Tato Bhavan Mahatatvam Avyaktat Kala Choditat Vigyanat Matma Dehas Tam Vishwam Vyanjang Tamo Nuda Tato Bhavan Mahatatvam Avyaktat Kala Choditat Vigyanat Matma Dehas Tang Vishwang Van Jams Tamo Nuda Tato Bhavan Mahat Tatvam Avyaktat Kala Choditat Vigyanat Matma Dehas Tang Vishwam Vyanjangs Tamo Nuda Ladies Tato Bhavan Mahat Tatvam Avyaktat Kala Chodita Vigyanat Matma Dehas Tang Vishwam Vyanjangs Tamo Nuda Tataham Thereafter Abhavat came into existence Mahat Supreme Tatvam Some total Avyaktat From the unmanifested Kala Choditat by the interaction of time. Vigyana Atma Unalloyed goodness. Atma Dehastam Situated on the bodily self. Vishwam Complete universes. Vyanjan Manifesting. Tamanudaha the Supreme Light. So the translation reads, Thereafter, influenced by the interaction of eternal time, the, sum, the supreme sum total of matter called the Mahatat became manifested. In this Mahatat, the unalloyed goodness, the Supreme Lord sowed the seeds of universal manifestation out of his own body. Okay, so... I say, and you please repeat, thereafter, influenced by the interactions of eternal time, the supreme sum total of matter 
called the Mahatat became manifested. And in this Mahatat, the unalloyed goodness, the Supreme Lord, sowed the seeds of universal manifestation out of his own body. So here is Prabhupada's purport. In due course of time, the impregnated material energy was manifest first as the total material ingredients. Everything takes its own time to fructify. And therefore, the word kala choditat, influenced by time, is used herein. The mahat tattva is the total consciousness because a portion of it is represented in everyone as the intellect. The mahat tattva is directly connected with the supreme consciousness of the supreme being. But still, it appears as matter. The mahat tattva, or shadow of pure consciousness, is the germinating place of all creation. It is pure goodness with the slight addition of the material mode of passion. And therefore, activity is generated from this point. Tato bhavan mahat tat dvam avyaktat cha kala choditat vigyanat mat madehastang vishvam vyanjam stamonuda. Thereafter, influenced by the interaction of eternal time, the supreme sum total of matter called the Mahat Tattva became manifested. And in this Mahat Tattva, the unalloyed goodness, the Supreme Lord sowed the seeds of universal manifestation out of his own body. So well, now we're in the section of this uh, part of Srimad Bhagavatam where we are discussing um, what creation actually looks like, how it works. And um, this is a fascinating subject. Everyone all over the world, whether they are theistic or atheistic, is fascinated by how this universe came to be. And there are many theories, and indeed not only many theories, but many stories all over the world, uh, in various cultures all over the world, of how this universe, material universe that we currently live in, how it um, manifested itself. And um, this is no accident, and it's no accident why people are so taken by the subject because when we understand how this universe came to be here at the same time we put into focus who we are what we're doing and where we might be wanting to go you know how did we get here what is this place and where should we go our sense of orientation in the whole scheme of things is fundamentally resting on this notion of how this universe came to be here. What is this place? Why is it so strange? And if you actually pay attention to the way the material world works, it is strange in many, many ways. It's not at all straightforward, you know. There's a lot of weird things going on in this world. And people have known it for a long time. Of course, there's been a progression over the years for science to try to banish all this strange stuff, you know, by beating it with clubs and trying to uh, curse it and uh, say bad things about it, denying its existence, pushing it off toward the edges, the uh, fringes of our reality and accepted uh, explanation of ourselves. So to every human being, your own explanation of who you are and how you got here is very key. And that's why, you know, 
we start off with the Vedic aphorism, aphorism Atato Brahma Jigas. First, one needs to understand themselves. To understand ourselves, we also have to understand what this place is. So, who are we, what is this world, and what relationship do we have with this world? How did we come into this situation? And at first blush, the first thing we notice is there's no easy, immediate way to figure this out. You know, you can't just guess at it. Um, and if you uh, try to figure it out on your own, there's no immediate clues. We don't see universes being born every day. So we don't see how this one came to be. Uh, we didn't witness our own birth. Uh, did we have something going on before our own birth? Uh, it's hard to know because generally speaking the process of reincarnation uh, wipes the memory clean more or less from the past and when we take birth in a new body we just kind of uh, at least in our own mind we take it from there that's our point zero and we start you know uh, looking at the world from that point onward within the framework of a new body and of course we don't know it but it's also within the framework of a new karma so our karma has been given to us as a result of things we did in the past so creation is a very fascinating subject and it gives us our basic orientation in the world and uh, last night I was watching a video from Sadaputta and he was talking about the Big Bang. And uh, he, you know, made some points in there that I had never really picked up on before that I thought were interesting. One of which was that he said, you know, this was, I think he was speaking in the early 2000s or the late 1990s. I'm not sure when he was speaking. He was saying that in Mayapur there would be a great temple. He called it the temple of understanding. Today we know it's called the temple of Vedic uh, planetarium. And that it would showcase for the world the understanding of what this universe is and our place in it. That's one of the main concepts that Prabhupada had for the Vedic planetarium. This would be a place where people could come from all over the world and get a fundamental understanding of what's really going on in this planet, in our existence as human beings, from a Vedic perspective as opposed to some other perspective. So uh, he also said that I think we need to be prepared to be able to talk about these things because uh, to capture the minds of people from the Western world, we're not going to be able to just brush these ideas out of the way. Because generally speaking, you know, even in a regular Bhagavatam, wow, so, <laughs> suddenly uh, I was like uh, all over, I, was be I became all pervasive for a few seconds. <laughs> Now I'm back from my Brahman form. Any rate, uh, so we need to be able to speak about these things in a rational and consistent way because in your actual Bhagavatam class, we are talking about things that sound very fantastical to most people. And the Vedic conception of creation and indeed the nature of the way the universe is laid out seem very fantastical to people that are raised in the culture and in the scientific uh, sort of uh, backdrop that most of us were raised in, you know, unless you were raised in the uh, villages of Bengal or somewhere else like that probably, you uh, would not have the same uh, notion. So. Um, because of our scientific past and the way our culture describes itself, um, we could call this um, a worldview or a zeitgeist 
or we could call it um, the mythology of the 21st century, you know. And every century, this is really boomy and hollow now. There's something needs to get adjusted in the volume. So every century or every millennium even has its own particular explanation of itself to itself. And uh, this time is no exception. If we read or we uh, do some investigation historically of how people thought of themselves a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, we'll find that people had very different answers to the questions that we answer in a particular way today. You know, they had very different answers to them. And this is an interesting study of culture. And we could also say it's a study of, from a scientific point of view, we could call it paradigm shifts. So um, things weren't always the way that they are. Things weren't always the way they are today in the way we explain ourselves to ourselves. And this has changed significantly. So what is our guarantee that in another hundred years, things won't also change very significantly? That the 22nd century uh, mythology will not be quite different, that the 22nd century zeitgeist won't be very different than the one we have today. There's no guarantee. However, the Vedas give us a consistent picture. This is the, the shining um, idea of the Vedas. And to get this point across, and to also be able to explain in a reasonable way, the things that we see in the Vedic literatures, like, you know, um, Narada Muni traveling from one planet to another uh, about uh, the magical abilities of some yogis, about the parts of the universe we don't see that are explained in Bhagavatam, like the plain of Bhumandala and uh, tree that's thousands of miles tall that Lord Shiva sits under. All these things, um, they do require some explanation for a modern mind, you know. Um, and as a group of devotees in the future, we have to come to these things. Of course, the BI is working on these things, and devotees have worked on these things for some time. Uh, and I think, you know, as time moves forward, we will have some explanation. The thing we should understand is that it won't be possible to explain everything because the universe is just too complex, you know. However, we can explain a lot of things and we can start to make a case for how central the Vedas are and should be to human thinking. And uh, what I wanted to point out was that we could do this from several angles. The first angle, of course, is the Vedas are written in a language called Sanskrit. So Sanskrit is a language which precedes Latin. And if you study Latin, you'll see that it's set up very, very similar to Sanskrit. And um, this was something that was not lost on the early Europeans when they came to India for the first time, especially when the East India Company uh, wanted to use India for its resources and conquered and, and threw the uh, Muslim rulers out and then took over India. So they began to investigate and they began to see that, wait a minute, this Sanskrit has a lot of similarity to Latin. Of course, that bothered them because they didn't want to be thought of as something that came after uh, the Indian uh, Sanskrit language. So Max Mueller came to the rescue and came up with this Aryan invasion theory, which has no basis in any archaeology anywhere. Um, but is still taught in many places and colleges 
And if you say anything against the Aryan invasion theory, people say that you are some kind of uh, Vedic, um, you know, chauvinist or something like that. But actually, there's no, there's no credence to the Aryan invasion theory. And who were these invaders? Nobody knows. And this mythical language of Proto-Indo-European that is touted as being the mother of all languages, there's no... It's a, it's a mystery language. There's no evidence of it. There's no, we don't know who spoke it. We don't know when they spoke it. We don't know anything about it. But it's given as the mother of all languages. So this is the first one. Of course, even um, uh, Ar Arthur Schopenhauer debunked uh, you know, uh, Max Mueller's understanding of that. But you know, most people have never seen this kind of thing or never really done much investigation into it. But this is, you know, um, a part of our history that one way to show the centrality of the Vedas is through a linguistic approach. We can show how you can make a case, you can't make an open and shut case, but you can make a strong case that languages originate from Sanskrit. And then the thing that I was mentioning the last few weeks was that we have this idea of demigods. And we see, if we look in the cultures of our world, that in the uh, Scandinavian Netherlands they worship demigods, the Greeks worship demigods, the Chinese worship demigods, in Africa they worship demigods, in the Americas they worship demigods, in the Polynesian islands they worship demigods, uh, in Egypt they worship demigods. Anywhere you want to go practically, even in Ireland they worship demigods. So wherever you go, there were these idea of demigods, you know, why this strange cultural similarity? And on top of it, there's some familiar, you know, characteristics to these demigods. There's one of them that carries a weapon, a vajra, uh, a hammer, or something like that, you know. There's, you know, why this peculiarity? You know, it shows that there was something like a world culture at one time, you know, that at one time, this idea of the demigods was everywhere, you know, from Africa to China to uh, the Middle East to wherever you want to go. Of course, the one thing that's always a little mysterious to me is actually the Middle East, where you have the um, Babylonian or the um, uh, Mesopotamian, uh, you know, uh, uh, civilizations where there you get some things that are very strange that don't seem to fit the picture exactly. But um, um, the idea that there are these demigods, these rulers or controllers, they live on a mountain. Uh, in a book that uh, Stephen Knapp, who is named Sri Nanda Nandana to the devotees, wrote about the proof of Vedic cultures, uh, world, uh, the creation according to the Vedas, I think is the name of the book. He has other books too. But in that, um, he opens with giving several accounts of creation stories, much like the one here in Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's surprising, it's surprising how many points of commonality there are in world cultures. This idea of a center mountain, you know, we say it's Mount Meru. However, uh, Asgard in Scandinavian culture, and you have uh, um, Olympus in Greek culture, same kind of concept is there. Um, there's some kind of place where the gods live and there's waters that go through it and that waters that go through it are even in American Indian culture. You know, this idea of the water dividing into four directions. Um, so this is bizarre, that this commonality of this Vedic picture seems to be in the background of many of our cultures, not all of them, but many of our cultures, and these common points are there. So we talked about the other day how I gave a kind of nickel tour of how our uh, present 
uh, view of our 21st century mythology or zeitgeist came to be, you know, that there was a religious view at one point. Everybody believed in religion and turned to religion for their basic understanding of who we are, how we got here. Then the attitude of rationality came in because many of the principles of uh, religious doctrine, especially, you know, the ones of the medieval Europe came under fire, under question. So people wanted to become rational and understand things from a rational perspective. This led into a philosophical, you know, era, you know, the age of enlightenment and beyond that. And we had the um, German idealists and then finally the um, British empiricists. And you have various philosophers. But what happened was that the philosophies never seemed to arrive at any final conclusion about anything. So then there was the rise of science. Now science was going to save the day and, and answer all of our questions. And it made a good go of it, but it fizzled out on the launching pad, you know, with the uh, Vienna Circle and the logical positivists. And they tried to prove everything on the basis of science, but wound up going in circles. And they never got there. However, most people don't know about that. And they never come into contact with that whole thing. But this is, from an intellectual, philosophical point of view, how we got to where we are. But there's yet another way that we can talk about how we got to where we are, which is a very interesting video by Suhotra Swami who he gives it in Helsinki, I don't know what year it is, it's uh, just before the 2000s, I think, or something like that. And he's discussing about the Vedic roots of our current religions, you know. How did we get to where we are? One of the points that um, Sri Nanda Nandana makes in his uh, uh, story about the creation is he makes the point that um, these creation stories seem to have kind of a, a similarity. And because they have a similarity, we look through religions, we find a thread there. That's one of the reasons why I'm very hopeful. Most of our modern religions are very, very dogmatic about many points. And they're not likely to overtly accept any of our philosophical points. However, if you look at history, you see that over time, uh, anything that really does work philosophically gets snuck in the back door of all these other religions. They'll never give the Vedas credit for where this idea came from. But we don't care, you know. Uh, it's the idea that counts, you know. And uh, eventually, um, if you can't beat them, join them, you know. So the idea will be that uh, these Vedic ideas which do visit more neighborhoods in this mysterious town of our world. They visit far more neighborhoods than any other scriptures or any other scientific literatures do. There'll, there'll be something to this. So, um, in this case, Suhotra focuses on the Middle East, particularly Persia. And um, he talks about a person known as Jaruta. And uh, Jaruta is a worshiper of Varuna, along with um, Vashishta. They're both worshipers of Varuna. Now, they have a difference of opinion in philosophy. And Vashishta banishes Jaruta from India. And Jaruta crosses over into what is now Iran. And uh, in Persia, the actual, the word Iran, its root comes from Arya, at least this is the way Suhotra puts it, positions it, that it comes from Arya. And so this Jaruta settled there and although he could not make his philosophy um, popular in India, he did make it popular in that region. And that philosophy is called 
Zoroastrianism. So Zoroaster is um, uh, either the, the Greek or the uh, um, Semitic name for, um, you know, uh, for this person, Charuta. And he taught a philosophy that was, excuse me, strikingly different from the Vedic philosophy. It had three main principles that when you hear them will start to sound familiar. <laughs> and the first principle he taught was that there was a duality, that there was a god and an anti-god of some kind or another. So uh, in Vedic literature you don't hear this, you know, but in Jiruta's philosophy he taught this idea that there is someone that is almost as powerful as God and God has to fight with that person uh, and sometimes God comes out on top and sometimes that other being comes out on top um, and this first entered the philosophy of world religions during this time when did this happen I, I was kind of surprised to find out that there were like three Zarathustras at least you know I never heard that before but uh, one as far back as 7,000 years ago and you know other times you know but at any rate whenever it was that um, this idea was that there is a deity or a supreme being but there's also a negative supreme being and in Zoroastrianism this negative supreme being is uh, known as Angra Mainyu or uh, Arhiman, there's different names for him. Uh, and he's fighting against Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda is the name for the Supreme Being. So this is a new thing on the world stage of religions, this new idea enters. And we see that this gets passed down into Judaism and then into Christianity and then into Islam. The same idea just sort of flows down. Of course, it's clear that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are related, you know. They follow one after another, you know, and uh, they actually do. Um, he, all, of, all three recognize the Old Testament. Um, you know, Christianity recognizes the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then, you know, Islam recognizes the Old New Testament and their own scriptures, the uh, Quran, so you've got that kind of thing. So here you have a new thing entering the picture. There is another interesting new piece of philosophy, that there's something called a judgment day, where time comes to an end, and there's a final judgment of everybody and uh, all the living creatures or beings who have existed, rather all the human beings who have existed, they all get put before the supreme being and some of them go to eternal hell and some of them go to eternal heaven and the world is remade and everybody lives in a kind of paradise here on the earth planet. So this is also a new idea that enters at this time uh, with the advent of Zoroastrianism. Of course, Zoroastrianism is now a very minor religion. It still does exist. It was pushed out of the Middle East by Islam for the most part. But um, it still does exist in some places. Um, and the third interesting thing, let's see if I can remember it, Well, maybe it'll come to me. Um, now, what's interesting about uh, this Zoroastrianism is that this uh, Jaruta, um, he flipped things a little bit. The Persian language takes the, um, you know, uh, S's, and changes them to H's, which uh, is how we get Hindu from Sindhu, 
you know, the, uh, the people in the Arabian Peninsula, you know, they called the people on the other side of the Sindhu River Hindus because they pronounced Sindhu with an H instead of an S. Now, if we follow that same linguistic thought or that same linguistic principle, we see that Ahura becomes Asura. So um, the philosophy that this Jaruta taught was that this group of people that they worshipped were the Asuras, actually. <laughs> uh, that, um, you know, who is Ahura Mazda? Ahura Mazda is um, uh, the Vedic name for him is um, Varuna. So Varuna is not a demon. However, Varuna is in charge of the demons. So the demons do offer sacrifice and worship and take some allegiance from uh, Varuna. So in uh, Jaruta or Zarathustra's you know, uh, presentation of religion, we get this idea that um, this uh, Ahura Mazda is a supreme being. And this supreme being would... Uh, eventually win. And uh, now who's on the other side? Who is this um, Angra Mainu or Arhiman? It turns out that uh, when we look linguistically into it, this is a reference to Brihaspati. So um, who is the spiritual master of the demigods? So according to this explanation in the Zen Vesta, in uh, this whole uh, religion of uh, Zoroastrianism, then the good guys are the Ahuras, the Asuras, and the bad guys are called Devas. <laughs> so <laughs> this religion flipped things upside down. And some of the other things that this new religion added were, were that there would be a virgin-born person coming that would deliver the world and that uh, celibacy was a sin. So uh, this, this is this uh, religion that added this to uh, what we have in um, the evolving picture of religions. And we can see that as this filtered on down that um, this became a part of the underpinning of our modern religions, whereas you don't find these things in the Vedic picture. So again, what's important about the Vedas, what's outstanding about them, is that they visit far more neighborhoods in the uh, uh, city of the world that we live in than anything else does. You will find some of these pieces in the other religions of the world, but you won't find the whole picture. And you will find some explanations in science for the way the world works, but you won't find the whole picture. You won't find the entire explanation of why we're here, where we're going. So if we look at the scientific understanding of how we got here, we learn that we are insignificant specks on an uh, unimportant rock in the backwater of some not very impressive solar system in some galaxy. And there are many, many, many other galaxies just like this. Uh, and what kind of picture does that leave you with? Uh, that A, Things are happening randomly, so it really doesn't matter how you live because everything's happening random. If tomorrow the whole world gets shattered with an asteroid coming too close, then you, you could have maybe enjoyed a little bit more if you'd known it was coming, but you know, nobody can do anything about it, so it's all over. You know? That's the picture it leaves you with. And how did it originally get like that? Uh, well, we have the Big Bang, which is what we originally started with. You know, Sadaput is talking about the Big Bang. 
And uh, most people don't realize that there was a time before scientists believed in the Big Bang. And uh, at that time, scientists believed in the steady state theory of the universe, that the universe had just always been here. And that it always more or less looked like what it looks like now. You know, things moved around. Excuse me. Things moved around, of course. Planets orbited and the stars moved around. But there was no um, change of anything. However, there was, oddly enough, a Catholic um, um, cleric who was named George Lemaitre who came up with this Big Bang Theory. He was um, a religious person. He was actually one of the Pope's uh, appointed people in uh, one uh, region of uh, investigation. And nobody believed him. The scientists didn't want to buy the Big Bang Theory because if there was a time of creation, that sounded too biblical, and they didn't want to go that way. So scientists really rejected the idea of there being a Big Bang. However, as time went forward, astronomers noticed that it appears like all the uh, specks out there, galaxies or whatever they are, are moving away from us, which makes it seem like we're at the center of an explosion. Things are moving out for, from us at, at a fantastic rate. So what's the explanation for this? And if you wind it backwards in time, you play the tape backwards, that means they're all coming in. And that must mean that they meet at one point. Oh no, this looks like George Lemaitre might have been right after all. And it turns out that even still, many scientists didn't want to go for this. They didn't like this idea. However, uh, Penzias and Wilson did some, um, you know, tweaking on a, some kind of um, uh, antenna that they were using to listen to signals in outer space. And it appeared that there was a signal coming from everywhere no matter which way they pointed the antenna, they had the same signal. And uh, they thought at first it was some, um, you know, a defect in the uh, electronics, but when they researched it, it turned out not to be. And then, oh no, everybody figured out, this must be the cosmic background radiation, you know. This is where, you know, we play the trumpets and uh, the whole symphony comes in going, na da 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 And now we hear the cosmic background radiation, which is the leftovers of the Big Bang. So at that point, suddenly there was enough evidence and everybody flipped over and became Big Bang people. And George Lemaitre was vindicated. Um, the Pope at that time congratulated George Lemaitre for his thing, and he said, yeah, now we've shown that uh, the, the, the Big Bang, there was a creation, and George Lemaitre said, my dear Pope, don't say this, this is not science. <laughs> so, go figure. Anyway, you know, it does show that there is some kind of, uh, you know, generation from a single point. But, you know, we see that in the scientific community, overnight, the whole picture can change. Overnight, when uh, some kind of uh, uh, new evidence is brought into the picture. So, um, um, we will have to, as devotees, go forward and try to investigate the history of science the history of our world, the history of cultures, the history of religions. And as we encounter people of this Western world, I think it's not easy, not very difficult to make a persuasive picture or a persuasive explanation of how these things really got there. And the fact that, yes, our material world has many things we don't see. The scientists are quite ready to accept many things we don't see. Um, but certain things that we don't see, they're not going to accept. But common people will accept them if we can give them a good background information, a good background explanation. So at any rate, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, any questions or comments? I've thrown a lot at you today. Yes. There's a microphone over here. Is that, uh, I speak very well, this, this is so that people downstairs can also hear. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, and so the people in video land can also hear you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this very um, mind-opening class. So um, there's a theme that I am trying to think about, and uh, it's about this question of very similar stories happening all around the world. Um, uh, just to add another thing uh, that's really similar between all these cultures, they are also all performing fire sacrifices in like a really similar manner. Mm -hmm. um, and so something I wonder about, because some of these cultures are really far away and like far removed from writing and the more complex cultures of for example, like India and the Middle East, like uh, the tribal cultures of like Native Americans, right, or Native right. Australians. So what I wonder is, do we have all these similarities because of contact or because these are eternal absolute truths that very uh, exalted sages within those cultures are realizing from within? Right. Well, uh, the way Prabhupada explains it, and he's commented on it a couple of times, that in the Battle of Kurukshetra, you had, you know, 630 million people died in that, and they were all Kshatriyas. So they were like the organizational fabric of the whole world at that point. And at that point, then, things started to gradually drift apart. And these cultures all drifted off in their own directions according to geographic isolation, you know, because of either great bodies of water, mountain ranges, uh, habitability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then um, these different cultures kind of, like a broken mirror or a broken picture, you know, shattered into different fragments. And each retained some aspects, but not the whole picture. And so now it's kind of like, they're meeting back up, but they don't understand where this came from. You know, in the American Indian tradition, there's this story about the buffalo of virtue who stands on four legs, but in this age is down to only one leg. So how strange, <laughs> maybe that sounds familiar, you know. How did, you know, as a culture as far removed as American Indian culture, have something like this, you know. So these kind of things are there. And um, so um, it points to the fact that, as Prabhupada puts it, that at one point Vedic culture was the whole world, not just India, it was the entire world. But at some point, because of the Battle of Kurukshetra or some other thing, uh, these cultures gradually fragmented and lost contact with each other. Each accepting or remembering some pieces of the overall picture and then unfortunately grafting some new things on which were speculative in some cases off the mark and now these cultures look at each other as if you know how could they have thought that you know uh, a, a snake that eats itself or this um, huge mountain or all these very interesting correlations from ancient uh, culture. Any other? Yes. Where did our microphone go? Okay. I have two questions. Yeah. yeah. So the first question at the end of the class, you mentioned that you encourage devotees to research, to find out how we got there. And by having this knowledge, we can easily convince others, especially Western people. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, actually, it's very difficult to research and find out more. Because uh, one point is that when we read those, those books, and then we have to read the books written by the non-devotees, right, it's very really right. difficult to find like a qualitatively uh, good, good book that speaks about it. There can be a lot of maybe cheating going on, or like it's, very, it's not so easy to find to do that. And then second of it also is that um, the main focus, obviously, is to read Shrima Bhagavatam, right. Tanya Chirtamrita, and then there's not so much time also. Right. So where to start and how to do it? Well, that we should always do first. You know, you should definitely have a strong foundation in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita. I don't mean to suggest that um, uh, we should supplant the reading of that with these other books. However, 
There is a certain section of our devotee community that needs and in fact must do these things. Otherwise, we will always remain on the fringes at just some other group of people who believe some pretty crazy stuff, you know. Um, um, and, you know, with the Temple of Vedic Planetarium coming to be a reality, um, either we'll have good explanations for how and why we have the Vedic Planetarium set up the way it is, or we won't. And if we don't, it's kind of like going into battle with the spear facing toward your own gut instead of facing the other way, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like that, you know. Uh, and that's why I think uh, the BI and other people who are kind of oriented in this direction. Um, and, you know, there are several fields that need to be investigated and need to be investigated in a systematic way by devotees who have this proclivity and then that could filter down to other devotees they wouldn't need to read all these you know uh, because there's tons of stuff you can get into with this and it's easy to also get lost in it or get turned around so um, these ideas could filter down you know we should do some you know of course uh, research into science which the BI is doing you know creation the nature of the universe etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, then history you know how these things work historically sociologically how these cultures evolved also you know the common threads among religious um, you know traditions all these kind of things um, plus another important uh, aspect is what's called the philosophy of science. How science itself has changed over time. Uh, what it considers veridical and what it doesn't consider veridical and all these kind of things, you know. At any rate, that's how I respond to that. Can I ask one more question? You had another question? Yeah, another okay. question. So that is um, about Vedic cosmology because you mentioned uh, in the beginning that it's good for devotees to understand Vedic cosmology, so then if other people challenge us, then we can explain it. So, um, I always struggle with the fifth canto when it speaks about Jambu Dvip and about Mount right. Meru, and I hear different devotees tell me different things about it, and nothing really sounded like really convincing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, about Mount Meru, that, that there's this big golden mountain in the middle of the universe, and um, some devotee explained to me, so actually it's not the golden mountain. Actually, you know, when it's, like, it's like many stars together, you know, when you see them from mm -hmm. the distance, it can appear like if there's like triangle shape, it can appear like a mountain. So then earlier days, the sages, when they look up, they would just describe it with this word, it's like a, like a golden mountain, you know, but it doesn't mean it's exactly like that. And then another devotee said, no, actually it is tangible, what the Bhagavatam says, everything is tangible. Um, we sh cannot, um, we cannot, like, uh, the other explanation is wrong, basically, the person was saying. And how it is, it is multidimensional. And because we're only three-dimensional, so then we can't, we can't see it, you know, because it's, it's on another dimension. Right, right. So what's, uh, what's the explanation? How is it? Well, I think, you know, over time devotees will uh, talk about these different possible explanations. And uh, I think as a consensus, as, as a devotee community, we'll come to accept some of these as more... Um, reasonable and others is not so reasonable. Um, I think to a certain extent that's already happening, but it's happening unofficially. Um, you know, I tend to go with the idea that uh, our material universe is um, obviously multidimensional in a number of ways. And there are many things in the Vedic literature that are said that are patently invisible to us. <clears throat> like Mount Meru, and it appears to be a globe earth, Bugola, and there's also the plain earth, the um, Bumandala, you know. And these two are related things, but they're not the same thing, you know, that uh, these are interrelated things, but they're not the same thing. As um, it's apparent that somehow or other, if you've heard of the concept of fractals, fractals are things that are self-similar on different scales. Like if you look at a leaf, you'll see that many leaves at the very edge of them have a little sort of zigzag serrated thing. But if you zoom in the microscope, you'll see that those little zigzags on the edge of the leaf, they have zigzags on them. And then 
you can go one more in and see that those zigzags have zigzags on them, each one being progressively tinier, you know. So the entire universe seems to be designed on this principle, that you have things that look similar on different scales. Like you look from a satellite picture of the um, waterways on the Earth, they, waters kind of branch out into different tributaries. But we see the same thing kind of in the vein system of the human being, you know. We see the same kind of thing even at smaller scales and on larger scales. So um, that there is a small earth, which is a globe, and a larger uh, um, system, which we call Bhumandala, uh, it's also called the earth, you know, in a certain way. You know, Bhu is there in both uh, words. So. Um, they're related things, but they're not the same thing. And we obviously don't see Bhumandala. We don't know, as Sataputta said, if you were going to find uh, Mount Meru, which way would you point the Palomar telescope? You know, obviously, you couldn't point it anywhere to see Mount Meru. So we could, you know, the scientists could point the finger and say, ha, 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 you guys can't show that this exists. Of course, yes, we can't. But then the scientists also their most recent uh, explanation is that 94% of the universe is missing. <laughs> uh, that, that's the current canonical scientific view. It's made up of dark matter and dark energy. 94%. So don't let anybody leave the room. The police are going to check everybody's pockets to see if... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if anybody is walking out with part of the universe, you know. So this huge, so the scientists are also in the same conundrum, that they are explaining a universe which mostly they can't see. Not only can they not see it, they can't explain what it exactly is other than to use these, you know, sort of nebula words, you know, dark matter dark energy. They're searching for it. They haven't found it. But without dark matter and dark energy, the orbital, um, you know, uh, configuration of the planet doesn't work. And uh, the galaxies spin in a way that defies Newton's laws. So they posit that there's this thing called dark energy that causes it to work like that. And without that, it doesn't work. Of course, modified gravity is an alternative thing. They have that idea. And then um, there's this other idea that the universe is expanding, and it's expanding at an ever-accelerating rate, if that's not scary enough. Uh, and what's causing it to do that? Enter dark energy. So um, these things are such massive players in the scientific explanation of how this universe is working that it says one of two things. There's big stuff we don't see or the whole thing's wrong. You know, one of those two things or something somewhat in between. So it's not only that the Vedic cosmology has uh, big things that we talk about that uh, we don't see and we can't bring somebody, you know, on a tour, you know, with uh, appropriate amount of money changing hands to view, you know, um, not only are we in that situation, but the scientists are also in that situation for the most part. So, any rate, yeah. No, no, that's kind of, that's kind of it. Because I just, one third question came into my mind. Uh -huh. The microphone, please. And uh, one question while I'm here to speak came to my mind that I noticed Often, at least when I was trying my Western outreach, then I noticed that it was not enough to convince persons intellectually. It seemed like when uh, in earlier days, when Shilabaksi Dansa Swati Thakur, he was preaching, he could just intellectually, philosophically defeat a person, and then this person would have integrity and surrender. Right, right. But these days, people, they don't have that. Like, even if you defeat them, it seems to me, even if you defeat them, they still won't take a book. <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I, I would never take that approach with, uh, you know, with uh, most people. The only reason you need it is when somebody's already starting to become interested in Krishna consciousness, but their mind naturally will hit these things and then they need to uh, get a sense of where does this all fit in. 
you know, uh, how does this work? How do we explain this? And of course, there are some people who are actually questioning, but they're not so dyed in the wool in hard materialistic science that rejects absolutely everything, you know, that's not, you know, on some equation somewhere. Um, they're not like that. Then they could be swayed with these kind of things. So, yes, why people accept something is usually because of someone's own character and their own faith and their own enthusiasm about what they're doing. That's usually why people accept. So I would never try to defeat someone to bring them into spiritual consciousness. If that's the necessity, then most likely it's not going to work, you know, because uh, as they say, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So uh, generally speaking, that's kind of the, the principle. All right. So uh, at any rate, thank you all for your kind of attention. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna. All glories to Prasadam. <laughs>